Hello, America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to Nature and the Nation. And for today's episode, I will be looking at the beginning of Western philosophy, interpretation of Anaximander and Parmenides, and that is by Martin Heidegger. This book is uh, was originally written in 1932. It was actually a lecture course uh, given in Germany in 1932. This book's translation into English is fairly recent. I think it's uh, within the past uh, decade. And it's an interesting lecture course. This, is, Like I said, 1932 is five years after the publication of Being in Time. And so you could say that Heidegger is sort of uh, at the height of his fame as a German uh, within the within the realm of German philosophy and he is at the you know nearing the height of his career uh, well I suppose that's debatable his fame let's say his fame um, but so you know he's he's discussing in this some of the things that he talked about in being in time and uh, and he's discussing them from a position of having considered them for the past five years after writing the book and and reflecting on other people's responses and whatnot. Uh, so I really like it because of the way that it dives into some of the stuff that Being in Time talks about. The way that, the way that this one is structured, the way that this lecture course is structured is it's divided into three parts. And the parts are actually fairly different. So the first part deals with Anaximander. And the third part deals with Parmenides. These are these two ancient Greek philosophers that he's discussing. But the middle part, part two, doesn't really talk an awful lot about either of them. It talks more about what is Martin Heidegger's project and also why he's going to the beginning, like the name of the course, the beginning of Western philosophy. Why is he going to the beginning of Western philosophy to seek out answers to his question. Um, and so I think it's just really fascinating because I think that, I don't know, it's almost like the three parts of this lecture course were written independently. And he had the essay on Anaximander and the essay on Parmenides, and then he had another essay that was kind of like unrelated, and he stuck them between the two. He ties them together a little bit um, because he has to, but it's really like reading a totally different essay when you read the second one versus the, the first and third. It's like the first and third are kind of like these prickly outer co coat covering and the of a fruit, and the second essay in the middle is this like juicy, comprehensible, like easy to read and understand um, like resource in the middle of this thing. The outer two are much more challenging. Actually, the last, the part three, the part about Parmenides, is not even as fully finalized i don't think it's it's still rough and in the form of like notes like this is derived from his lecture notes and uh, with his help it was turned into a more readable form but um for some reason i don't think that the, the third portion was actually attended to in the same way that the first two parts were and so the third part there's like it's not really complete sentences sometimes it just seems like it's lecture notes sometimes, and it's very challenging. It draws a lot on the Greek text and the Greek characters and the meanings of the various Greek words of the fragments. Um, I don't read Greek. I don't read Greek characters. So it was kind of challenging to to work my way through the first and third, and especially the third. But the, the middle one was really like a joy to read because it, I really felt like, oh, hey, I understand this. You know? It really felt like it was it was written for people who... Maybe, you know, like Being in Time is probably written for other professional philosophers, and this is written for students, and it's after a few years of reflection, and it's just like, oh, this is excellent. Probably underrated uh, writing of Heidegger's is this middle section of this lecture. So as always, I'm going to read some parts to you. I'm going to read two parts from part one, where he, he reads about, or he, I'm sorry, he speaks about Anaximander. And the other, uh, let's see what I say, I have eight parts. So the other six parts that I'm going to read out loud will all come from part two. And I'm not going to read anything from part three. It just doesn't really, I'm sure it doesn't really come across well read out loud. And I'm not sure that my comprehension is really uh, 
uh, all that stellar of part three either. Um, I don't want to get out over my head here. Uh, but he, one thing he does say in part three when he's talking about Parmenides is he does say that uh, Par Parmenides is, identifies the goddess that he goes to speak to because Parmenides like basically pre presents this this poem of going to speak to a goddess and being given this philosophical uh, vantage point and identifies that that goddess is indeed Aletheia, the goddess of truth or um, more probably more accurately the goddess of disclosure or unconcealment. Uh, so that's that's an interesting thing that I want to talk about more, but I'm going to talk about Parmenides more in uh, a different lecture. I'm sorry, in a different uh, podcast episode, an upcoming one uh, with a different book that talks more about Parmenides. So let me go ahead and jump into some portions here of part one, where he's talking about the fragments of Anaximander. Those fragments are few. Um, let me actually just read the main thing that he's talking about, where he, pre he presents a, a translation of this fragment, translated by Nietzsche, and the, the fragment goes, Whence things have their origination, thence must they also perish according to necessity, for they must pay retribution and be judged for their injustices according to the order of time. So that's Nietzsche's translation of that fragment. Uh, he talks, you notice Nietzsche mentions justice. Uh, they, they pay retribution and judged for their injustices. Uh, and that is why things which have their origination must also perish. All right, so I want to jump into what Heidegger says here. Like all my books, I'm going to read some decent sections here, some longer than others. But this part, he's talking about his translation, his understanding, which is kind of unconventional of what an Axemander is saying. So he says, quote, Proceeding now to the individual words, we find a dikia translated as guilt, wickedness, and we read elsewhere of an adikos epos, a guilty horse, or a profligate one, or even a sinful one. That is, of course, not the meaning. It is a matter instead of a horse that is not broken in, a horse that will not run in harness, does not fit in, is not pliant, is without compliance. Here, a non-compliance reigns. Compliance, that is harmonization, the dovetailing of the totality of something coordinated in itself. Compliance, therefore, characterizes something interrelated. We see this in phenomena such as day, night, birth, death, etc. Its opposite is non-compliance, where the being is somehow out of order. A dikia is non-compliance in this original sense. Certainly at times a dikia means injustice or something similar, and later it takes on this sense exclusively. In our context, however, the word has no moral juridical meaning, but just as little does it mean structure in a neutral sense or the like. How we need to take the counter-concept, dike, is thereby already expressed. Compliance. Compliance, that which incorporates something, which provides the cadre for something, and which has to accommodate this something. None of the usual notions of justice, judgment, penalty, and recompense may be admitted here. And so also the third concept, tesis, cannot immediately be translated as retribution or atonement. Instead, tu originally means appreciate, take the measure of something in its relation to something else. Determine whether and how it corresponds to something else. Therefore, we will translate not with retribution or atonement, but with correspondence. Whereas dike, compliance, emphasizes the belonging together as such, tesis brings out the respective measuring off of the correspondence. It is clear that this meaning of tesis supersedes its meaning as retribution and atonement, and it is just as clear that there is no necessity or even possibility to speak automatically of retribution upon encountering the word tesis. Hence, we must not maintain that in antiquity these words had at first an individualized practical moral meaning, which was then subsequently altered and transferred to non-moral relations of beings from other regions. It is the reverse. And we must think that in antiquity, individual regions of beings were not at all separated out yet. 
The delimitations arose for the most part only in connection with the rise of the sciences and had the effect of diverting and making murky the original comprehensive view of beings as a whole. End quote. Okay, so he's really just saying that where Dyke and Adikia were translated previously as justice and injustice, their earliest use was not so morally connoted. Um, the, the words that he prefers to use are compliance and incompliance. Uh, so that's interesting. What does he mean by that? The, the second part here that I'm going to read is also from part one, so it's also about the Anaximander fragment. And he's talking about this compliance and non-compliance idea uh, a little bit further. So in this section, he says, quote, in what does the non-compliance persist? How does it persist? These two questions are one. The core allegation of the pronouncement is that the being of beings consists in non-compliance. We will have to ask, how did the previous interpretation grasp the being of beings? Will a further elucidation permit us finally to gather how the non-compliance persists and why it persists? The only basic character of beings that was mentioned up to now is appearance, along with its most properly concomitant disappearance. Reference was made to day and night, birth and death, etc., this reference initially served as an illustration, but it would be a fatal misunderstanding to take day and night, birth and death, merely as examples and particular cases of appearance. Such conception already distances us from appearance in the Greek sense, provided we were ever in its vicinity. We remain victims of modern thinking. For day and night are not to the Greeks just any random appearances like among others. On the contrary, in day and night, the originary appearance reveals itself. And that is not simply because day and night encompass everything. Day and night are the basic appearance in the genuine sense because they constitute the ground of all other appearance. They permit all other appearances to arise. For while the day shows itself, the light, brightness, appears, and precisely this appearing light first lets appear all other beings sea and land, forest and mountain, human being and animal, house and homestead. And as the day recedes, giving way to the night, it in a certain way takes the appearing things along with it, and cedes sovereignty to the night, which conceals everything. In the luster of the day and of the light, beings appear. The light, the sun, what allows appearance, allows beings presence in being, that is time. Today we are not one step further along, on the contrary, our artificial light essentially does not exceed the power of light. At most, we thereby completely mistake the light and forget our original bond to it. What does that mean? Every being sets itself out in relief. Every being raises itself up over and against others. Appearance is not merely a stepping forth. The stepping forth is an entering into a contour and into the limits of the contour. Set out in its contours, standing out in them, the being is, i.e. comes into the light of day. Contour. Not an indifferent framework, but the integrating, gathering power and inner substantiality of things. Thus, through the clarification of an appearing thing, in its appearing, a new essential character of the being of beings has obtruded. More precisely, appearance as emergence has been better determined as an entering into contours, appearing, emergent entrance into contours. The experience of beings as what appears in possessing such being, that is the primal experience of the Greeks. Yet what is this to us, this sharper and fuller formulation of the essence of appearance? It should bring us closer to an understanding of the being of beings, but that in turn, is for the sake of understanding, on the basis of such a grasp of beings, how being persists in the non-compliance, which constitutes the non-compliance of beings. If the non-compliance is not something tacked onto beings in the guise of a defective property or a 
belated epiphenomenon, but if it belongs, as Anaximander basically says, to the essence of beings as beings, then a sufficiently broad and penetrating elucidation of the essence of being must clarify how the non-compliance predominates here in beings as such. That which stands in apparentness is, as such, non-compliant, out of order. What can this now mean in terms of the expanded clarification of appearance? We will try to clarify it in the context of the pronouncement by way of a free construction, so to speak. Appearance means emerging entrance into contours. This entrance into is supposed to be out of order. Whence steps that which enters into contours? Out of a lack of contours. What holds itself in apparentness persists in contours over and against contourlessness. The non-compliance would then consist in the possession of contours. Seen this way, what then is disappearance? Let us remain within the basic experience of the Greeks. When day gives way to night and darkness falls over things, then contours and delineated colors disappear. The limits of things become indistinct and fade away. Things lose their substantiality and individuality. Everything is concealed in the gaping void of darkness. Disappearance is accordingly a stepping back out of the possession of contours into contourlessness. Returning to appearance is then a giving way to a persistence in contours. In giving way to it, the appearance takes into consideration the non-compliance occurring through an abandonment of contourlessness. The receding acquiesces to the contourlessness and in this acquiescence testifies to it. Thus, the non-compliance would then be persistence in contours over and against contourlessness, and compliance return to contourlessness." End quote. Okay, so you probably can guess from hearing this how challenging it, it can be to read and comprehend Heidegger. Uh, that was probably the most concise and comprehensible section of part one. And so he's basically stating that like a def the default state of things is like contourlessness and indefiniteness. Um, and contour is appearance and that is definiteness and that is a, a state of non-compliance. So it's a stepping away from the default and into this non-compliant state of of appearance and, and contour. Strange and interesting perspective and, and really not the typical understanding of Anaximander. As I said, it's a little it's a little bit different, but it's interesting to think about it that way. When you think about it like that, you're starting to see things from this Heideggerian perspective of disclosure and the and being and it's all it all just kind of puts you in a very interesting mindset but it's hard to express in words i guess that's what makes heidegger so good at it anyway um i'm going to move on to the rest of my quotes which all come from part two part two uh is not about anaximander or parmenides it's just about the beginning it's this is about the beginning of western philosophy and he talks about why we should study the beginning of things. And I just think this is really interesting and, and beneficial. So in this section, at the very beginning of part two, uh, he says, quote, appearance, non-compliance, time, limitlessness. Are we not floundering here very unsteadily amid empty words? With what right do the pronouncements at issue present themselves? How do they intend to demonstrate their truth? On what path are they acquired? Are they not at all mere decrees, conceits of a flighty arbitrariness and not strict science? Yet it makes no difference, whatever they may be, whether science or philosophy or poetry or something else for which we have no name. Since these pronouncements are inaccessible to us, we feel no nearness to them. They are no longer of any concern. Moreover, if we accept that what we had to concede right at the start namely, that little has been handed down and this little is even incomplete, 
then does not the entire project of seeking out the beginning of Western philosophy become problematic in the highest degree? To be sure, it is accordingly time to pose relentlessly the objections to which our project is exposed. We will reduce them to four. Number one, between us and that beginning of Western philosophy lies a temporal span of two and a half millennia. The world and mankind have radically altered in the interim. That early time is so far removed it must remain inaccessible. Arranging a lecture course such as, the, such as this will not simply leap over the 2,500 years. Number two, yet even if it were possible on the basis of other sources to bridge this gap to some extent, what would the effort avail us? Only to establish finally that in the meantime philosophy has advanced very far. What then are we supposed to do with these long surpassed issues and dicta? We have today especially for whom the newest can never be new enough. How could we more sharply reproach and spurn something than by pointing out it is antiquated? Number three. We might be conceded that this antiquated thought did continue on in what followed and did determine later developments and can therefore claim significance for itself. Even so, this significance will vanish as soon as we note how crude and much too meager these propositions and doctrines look in comparison, for instance, to the inner vitality of the Platonic dialogues or the compactness and fullness of the Aristotelian treatises or especially in comparison to the breadth and complex stratification of the works of Kant or Hegel. We who know all this resist such all too primitive, simple, and insipid truths, and we feel it is almost an affront to be required to take seriously these ever so crude attempts made at the beginning, we to whom truth cannot be sufficiently intricate and provocative in order to count as truth at all. Number four, let even this be conceded. The simplicity and crude character of these propositions should not prevent us from pondering their content. In the end, however, does that not signify a mere scholarly occupation which entices us into all possible artifices of interpretation and perhaps momentarily enchants us with the previously unfamiliar ideas? Yet it all remains a world of shadows and semblances, so that we do not come up against anything which could affect us of today let alone conclusively and lastingly change us. Indeed, it is all unreal, a literary, philological invention, and therefore without any compelling power over us. That is a compact series of weighty objections, unbridgeable span of time, antiquated, crude and meager, unreal and shadowy. Our project is exposed to such objections, provided it intends to be something other than a far-fetched, obsolete, an altogether irrelevant report on a long-vanished age of human history. Can these objections be disabled, perhaps by refuting them with counter-arguments? Yet can this vanished time indeed be expected to return by way of a refutation of objections, and become new and fertile and real? In fact, a reality never arises out of the mere refutation of false views. To charge headlong at those objections would be useless without wondering at all about the content and essence of the presuppositions from which the objections arise and draw sustenance. What is speaking out in those objections? It is we, ourselves, which is why they seem judicious and pressing. We, therefore, we, the way we behave when we say unbridgeable span of time, antiquated, crude and meager, unreal and shadowy, we act in the reeling off of these objections as if we were undoubtedly ready to lend an ear to the beginning of Western philosophy. We act as if we were not only ready, but naturally also predisposed to let it say something to us. We act as if we were even capable of deciding whether this beginning has something to say to us or not. We even think that such would be an honorable endeavor, and we flatter ourselves on the critical prudence with which we look upon the project of seeking out the beginning. We do all this, but what if we are thereby deluding ourselves? And what if this self-delusion was one that found it fitting to take shelter behind those objections. Perhaps well-intentioned, but nonetheless a great self-delusion that shelters behind the objections, shelters behind precisely in order to shelter itself from ever becoming actually exposed to those early times. It is, of course, a self-delusion. What does that self-delusion consist in? 
one with which we have long been stricken. In the fact that humans have convinced themselves that the old is the antiquated, the antiquated the past, the past what no longer is, and what no longer is as non-being, a sheer nullity. What could be more obvious than this conviction that the old is the antiquated, and what is easier to cast off than the antiquated, since indeed as past it passes away of itself? Is this self-delusion accidental? If it is, then how does it come to be so widespread? It derives from a firmly seated prejudice about humans and about their relation to history. The prejudice is that this relation consists in and is based on historiological cognitions. We take ourselves to be disposed and authorized without further ado to judge what history, and especially the past, can mean to us and is allowed to mean to us. The four objections stem from a single prejudice, one so well guarded today that it faces not even the least danger. On the contrary, at most it is increasingly advancing. For what age has ever acquired so many and such varied historiological cognitions as ours? When were past cultures and human types ever rummaged through and psychologically and analytically probed to such an extent? When were these constantly accumulating cognitions ever served up with such a shameful top dressing that in today's journalism, a journalism whose very successes do not allow this science to sleep, must not finally such an excess of historiological co cognitions show us the full totality of history and prompt us to believe we had a relation to history? Or is this monstrous amount of historiology precisely what rivets us to the prejudice about our supposedly genuine and authoritative relation to history? Can historiological cognition create at all, originarily, a relation to history? No. On the contrary, historiological cognition is itself possible only on the basis of an originary relation to history. Historiology can explain and expand this relation, but can just as much also undermine and slacken it, and above all can delude us precisely about the endangering destruction, and thus the complete lack of any basic relation to history. That is how matters stand today. Therefore, we can, without scruples, believe ourselves justified in bringing forward objections against the possibility and intrinsic value of the project of seeking out the beginning of Western philosophy, and also justified in finding these objections self-evident. Indeed, we even believe we are attempting to be especially critical and serious when we strive to make such objections heard. Assuming, however, it could actually and convincingly be declared that our purported relation to history is merely a prejudice and that consequently we lack any intrinsic claim to be competent to put forth these objections, indeed that they have been put forth only from not understanding history and from a negative relation to it. Assuming all this, then would the objections not have to collapse, whereby refutation of them becomes superfluous? Certainly, but what would then be gained? We would not have eliminated the objections by way of a refutation, but instead would have disabled them in advance through a withdrawal of their ground. Yet will the temporal distance of two and a half millennia that separates us from the beginning become less thereby? Will the beginning become less antiquated thereby? Through the dismissal of the objections, do we attain the positive result that the beginning is of some immediate concern to us? Can such reflections, no matter how subtle, simply conjure up an actual relation to history and to the beginning? Two and a half millennia. The myriad changes in the world and in humanity cannot be undone by such reflections, quite apart from the circumstance that we still do not see to what end that should happen. Are not beginnings, rather, in each case, there precisely so that, after them, everything moves away from them? We remain shut off from the beginning, whether or not we refute the cited objections, whether or not we wonder about the presuppositions on which they are based, whether or not we simply disregard them. No artifices of interpretation can transport us over this gap of millennia. No so-called empathy can magically replace something bygone with something real. That is how matters stand if we stay sober and do not fool ourselves. We must face the fact of our continuous movement away from the beginning. More precisely, we must face the fact of our detachment from the beginning. And it is not a splendid thing to bow soberly to the facts, 
especially when they are as indisputable as the constantly increasing distance of the present from the past, our movement away from it. Yet the facts are also peculiar in not being exhausted by what we casually and obviously ascertain about them. To be sure, we usually believe that in this way we possess what the fact is. We do not take into account and have no eye for what in the end could be the case with the so-called fact. Yet what then could this indubitable temporal gap between us of today and the beginning of philosophy still further be? What concealed possibility could still lurk in this naked fact? Let us indicate this possibility first by way of an image. A wanderer in an arid region must distance himself more and more from the spring at which he first and last drew water. Viewed soberly, his distance from this spring is thereby increasing. He leaves the spring behind, and with his increasing distance he loses his orientation. The spring, in the end, lies inaccessibly far behind. Assume the wanderer then dies of thirst. Why did he die? Presumably because, at too great a distance from the spring, he no longer had a relation to it. Yet how is the too great distance from the spring no longer a relation to it? At a sufficiently great distance, does this relation cease to be a relation? Or is the excessively great distance from the spring always still a relation to it? A negative relation, but still precisely a relation, and even one that is hardly inconsequential. Does the wanderer somehow get loose of the spring in the increasing distance? Does he step away from a relation to it? The opposite is the case. Does not the spring pursue him more importunately the closer he comes to dying of thirst? Indeed, soberly calculated, is it not precisely the very far distant spring that lets him perish? Therefore does not the wanderer, in his roaming and advancing, come to perish because of nothing other than this spring? An image. What if, now, in our relation to the beginning of Western philosophy, we were such advancing wanderers? What if, not just today, but since long ago, the advancement of Western philosophy were a constant, ever greater perishing because of its beginning. And what if, in this history of perishing, precisely in it, the beginning pursued and importuned the one advancing? And what if, in this pursuing and importuning, the beginning were constantly there, in the closest proximity, a quite different proximity than could be pointed to by the image of the spring and the wanderer? And what if this closest proximity of the beginning had to remain concealed precisely on account of the advancement. How do matters now stand with the naked fact that in advancing we distance ourselves from the beginning more and more? This fact has changed. It has become richer, even if merely with regard to possibility. The fact of distance includes the possibility that the relation between us and the beginning is a negative relation a negative relation thanks to which the beginning stands concealed in our own closest proximity. This fact not only stands before us, we also stand in it, thus in the possibility that the beginning has the closest proximity to us. But then the question of whether we can or cannot leap over these two and a half millennia is a bagatelle compared to the question of whether we experience and see that the beginning pursues us and importunes us out of the closest proximity. The temporal distance of more than 2,000 years, this gigantic span of time, would in its significance be nothing compared to this negative relation of nearness. The invoking of the mere fact of this temporal distance would then at most be a deception, which we only strengthen with the alleged sobriety. In the end, we must decide at least to look into the face of the possibility of the dangerous closest proximity of the concealed beginning. We must learn that here and in general, in the naked fact of history, the essential is hidden, that only apparently does the naked fact constitute the actual happening of history, and that the representation of history becomes even more destitute when so-called ideas are tacked on to so-called facts and ideology is used to help explain history. It has not yet been seen that this ideologism is the worst positivity and that the latter is even still dominant.
We must, therefore, face the possibility that our relation, or negative relation, to the beginning of Western philosophy does not primarily depend on the extent of the intervening temporal span. In other words, it could be that we remain as far removed from the beginning as we are today, even if the beginning happened only a decade or a year ago. It could be that in our, in our negative relation to the beginning, we are so very obdurate that not only are we simply unable to experience and grasp its proximity, but we do not want to. We must face the possibility that the beginning is not the old in the sense of the antiquated, but that we are so very antiquated that we can no longer understand a beginning, and especially cannot understand when we invoke the advanced and the contemporary. We must then also face the possibility that this inceptuality of the beginning is not the elementary and primitive, that what we call primitiveness is nothing other than the simplicity proper to everything great, and that we do not grasp this simplicity because we do not see greatness on account of our having long ago become too small. For only what is itself great, or at least in an essential sense knows about greatness, can in turn encounter the great. In the end, we must face the possibility that the beginning, which no longer seems to be of concern to us, importunes us to the highest degree out of the closest proximity, that it constantly does everything with us, and that without it we cannot do the least thing. That we are no longer able to confront this importuning of the beginning is our unsurpassable cluelessness and harmlessness with which we are washed away in history. To put it succinctly, we, the obdurate, antiquated, small, and harmless, must face the possibility that it is not the beginning in its peculiarity which prevents us from coming close to it, but that we ourselves, indeed unwittingly, prevent ourselves from seeking out the beginning. This obstacle consists, then, in nothing less than our inability to do anything with the beginning. Only one who can do something with the beginning disposes of the inner preparation for the project to seek out the beginning. Therefore, when we said at the start of the lecture course, we want to seek out the beginning of Western philosophy, that was not an innocuous remark and an incitement to a more or less amusing or boring engagement with a few old scraps of texts, but instead, rightly understood, is the will to gain mastery in some way over our inability to do anything with the beginning. End quote. Okay, so that was super long. That was the, lo the longest part I'm going to read. I was like, oh... I don't know, seven pages, eight pages. That was a, lo a long section. The very beginning of part two, and he's talking about the beginning and our inability, and he puts forward four objections to reasons why we shouldn't or ex shouldn't expect to get much or anything out of a study of the, the beginning of Western philosophy. And then he basically says, what if all of Western philosophy has been similar to a wanderer in the desert, wandering further and further away from a spring, and that the distance from... The, between the wanderer and the spring, even once the spring has totally been lost, his orientation toward the spring is totally lost, the distance from the spring is the most important thing as he gets more and more in need of a drink of water. And when he dies of thirst, it was precisely his distance from the spring which was nearest to him as he die, lay dying on the desert floor. Uh... So that's an interesting way of considering distance and that the, the idea is that the beginning is, of Western philosophy is super close to us at all times in the direct sense that we have moved away from that beginning. And he talks about how it's actually important to study the beginnings of things. Um, and he says only great, only great, things or great people or who have some relationship with greatness can understand other great things. And there's a sort of greatness in the beginning of Western philosophy that we can't even perceive because we're too small. So that's pretty, that's a pretty hot take on the beginning of Western philosophy. Um, and then he moves on to the next section I want to read here and begins to talk about the question of being, which is more like the real the real mission of Martin Heidegger is a, a study of the question of being. So I'm skipping ahead a little bit. You know, he, he, he kind of walks through this really step by step, but I, I, obviously I can't cover every single step along the way of his thinking. But he comes to a point here where he begins to talk about the question of being. And in this section, he says, quote, Therefore, as far back as we can go, 
This is what is peculiar to the beginning, the grounding utterance of being about beings. We may take this as a provisional characterization of the beginning. What is dealt with there in particular is the limitless, compliance and non-compliance, time and appearance. We do not want to forget all this hereafter, but at first we will place no further demands on it. Yet is this utterance, which is of being and about beings, merely a characterization of the beginning? Is not this utterance the beginning itself? Even if it can be said with some justification that the pronouncement is not only the oldest testimony from the sphere of the beginning, but is the actual first beginning itself, we still must not see in this pronouncement the authentic beginning. Why not? We take from the pronouncement it is a grounding utterance. The grounding utters the ground in saying, therefore and for this reason. Being has the mentioned characters, but to announce the therefore and the for this reason means to speak by referring to a wherefore and a why. And so is to be related to a question. Such an utterance is called an answer. The pronouncement is not simply an assertion, it is an answer. The content of the pronouncement may be ever so controversial in itself and also in its interpretation, but what is beyond controversy is that as an answer, it is essentially rooted in a questioning. The beginning, therefore, resides not in the pronouncement as such, but in the questioning to which the pronouncement is a response. The grounding utterance, as answered with the ground, already contains the questioning. The full content of the pronouncement is not at all grasped if this questioning is left unheeded. For this questioning is not merely the way it comes to be answered, the mere mode of origination of the pronouncement, which could be left out once the pronouncement had originated. On the contrary, the dictum does not in the least speak as itself unless it speaks as an answer, i.e. unless it is uttered at the same time and above all as a question. Consequently, if the pronouncement is communicated merely as an assertion and is transmitted in such communication, then the communication remains essentially incomplete. Even if the pronouncement is discussed ever so extensively, and as compared to other pronouncements, it is still not actually communicated, for in this way it is still impossible to take part in its full content, i.e. to take part in its questioning. As long and as often as the pronouncement is proposed and repeated merely as an assertion, the communication remains essentially incomplete. And furthermore, this incompleteness produces an outright perversion to the character of the pronouncement. In that case, the questioning expressed here, provided it is remarked in the least, remains somewhat contingent and all too obvious, in which one need not further involve oneself. Only if we partake in the questioning expressed in the pronouncement do we grasp the latter's inceptuality, its beginning character. As a mere assertion, the pronouncement is not at all a beginning, but is at most the end of a train of thoughts that is as negligible, once the result is given, as the scaffolding once the house is standing. Accordingly, when we speak of the beginning of Western philosophy, we do not mean the dicta and pronouncements that lie there at the beginning, i.e. in those early times. Instead, we mean the act of beginning itself, that which possibly expresses itself in such dicta. We mean the beginning as an occurrence, not the first detached, deposited result behind which we can go no further back. The beginning is thus an act of beginning in the mode of a questioning. In our search for a characterization of the beginning, the essence of the beginning has become more precisely determined. The beginning as an act of beginning. The act of beginning as a questioning. The questioning as a questioning that discloses being. The questioning as the question of being. Can this questioning be characterized more precisely, initially, only to the extent that we know the appertaining answer, the pronouncement? This was ultimately grasped as the grounding utterance of being about beings. The questioning maintains itself in the domain of that about which the answer is given. It is to beings that we turn, asking what they are. Beings are the interrogated. In what regard are they interrogated? In regard to that which determines beings as beings. In regard to their being. We ask after that. Being is that which we ask after. We see, however, the saying is a grounding utterance of being. 
What is announced is not simply that being is such and such, but why it has this character. The question of the what unfolds into a questioning of the ground of the what. The questioning is a seeking out of the essence ground, a grounding of being. This grounding question of the being of beings, we call the questioning that discloses being. End quote. Okay, so that's pretty cool. I kind of like the, um, the metaphor he makes of the uh, scaffolding on the house and like the answer, like the, the, the fragment that we have from an Axamander is actually a statement and it is the answer to a question that was asked and the question that was asked and the thinking that went into the creation of the fragment is like the scaffolding of the house. The fragment is the house. But to understand the beginning of Western philosophy, we need to understand the questions and the thoughts that went into the creation of the house, a.k.a. the fragment. So that when he talks about the beginning, he's not talking about the furthest back scrap we can find but the occurrence of a beginning in which the questions begin to be asked which are attempted to be answered by the beginnings of philosophy by an axe matter and i think that's all really really cool so his whole project of of the question of being seems to like drive right back to the beginning of western philosophy because it seems like that's what he's equating the Oasis too is like, is like que the engaging in the questioning of being, and then somehow the answer came about, and somewhere along the line we've just like deviated further and further away from the beginning or the question of being. Um, so worth worth trying to figure out more what he's trying to say about. It. I think it's pretty pretty interesting, and I just I like the 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 premise of valuing the beginning of things. Um, and and seeing a closeness of the beginning that we're always affected by the beginnings of things. I don't know. It's it's interesting. Look back, but I also think it's interesting. I'll jump in for a quick interposition. That I believe it was Edmund Burke who was talking about how oftentimes the beginnings of things, if you look too closely at them, there's a bit of brutality. Things aren't always founded on the most noble acts and there's a sort of a mythology that must be laid over things, institutions, I guess is really what Edmund Burke is talking about, to kind of hide their beginnings in a hazy mist in order to draw about the adequate um, esteeming of the things. Is that a sort of a noble lie? Um, I don't know, it's kind of interesting that maybe like the deepest look at the beginnings is not really always going to yield, and kind of like Nietzsche was talking about in the few books back, about how things really should be understood at their height. Of course, Nietzsche places the height of Western philosophy in ancient Greece, but it's a bit of a different thing. One one is looking for the apex of things, and, and Heidegger, Nietzsche's looking for like the apex of things, and Heidegger is looking for the real beginning of things. Anyway... Let's move on here. So, uh, do, do, do. so he, he's he goes on talking about the question of being at length. That's really kind of the subject of much of the rest of this part two. He says, "Quote: Fine. This then is the question of being. We have gained all sorts of information about it, but have not experienced it itself. Despite all our discussions about questioning in general and about the various interrogative forms and." The place of the question of being amid them, despite the preeminence of the question of being over and against all other questions, despite all this, the question of being remains nebulous to us, and ultimately no more than a word. And it will remain so until we set out and ask this question. Only in that way, as an asked question, does it become for us more actual as a question, and thereby become a possible characterization of the beginning and of its possible proximity, of the beginning in the mode of questioning. The task is now to ask, actually ask, the question of being. Thus, let us ask it, without circumlocution or sideward glances. What are beings, namely with their respect to being? Answer. We have no answer. 
Even if we had one, no person would want to maintain that in asking the question we already had the answer. Yet with this questioning, do we not also at least have the question? Then does the questioning consist only in this, namely that the interrogative sentence and its formulation are recited and repeated? What are beings? If we actually want to ask, must not something have become problematic to us here? And how else do we encounter the problematic than by its placing us into the uncertain, the indeterminate, the ungrounded, the open? The problematic brings us the unrest of indecision, whether something is so or is otherwise, or even is so at all. The disquiet from the problematic can increase to the point of torment, a tormenting question. Are we tormented or even disquieted by the question, what are beings? Not at all. For if indeed this is a question, it is an insignificant and unprofitable one with which we can neither bring order to the finances of the empire nor create work for the six million unemployed. The question of being contains nothing disquieting for us. Perhaps we are hearing it now for the first time and it leaves us cold. The question is unproblematic to us. That is why we cannot actually ask it. Yet why is the question of being unproblematic? Perhaps because we find nothing like the problematic in it. Why so? Because the question of being bears nothing problematic. That would be a hasty contention, for have we at all seriously thought what might be problematic in the question of being? Manifestly not. How then can we say we find nothing there? Initially, the question of being is exhausted for us in the recited formula. What are beings as such? End quote. Okay, so that's cool. He introduces, he demands that the question be asked. What are beings? Is he, so it's not, he doesn't actually like spell it out like what is being, but he more asks, what are beings? And what are beings gets to the essence of the being of beings, in which case the question of being arises. So what are beings as beings? And it's like, it's really like the question, like, what is a thing? Like if, like if you've got a table and it's got four legs and it's made out of wood and you can describe these things about it. And like, if you strip away the very, like it's to say that it's made out of wood, that's a quality. It has four legs. That's a quality of it to say that it, you know, you set things on it. Well, that's a function, a sort of a quality. If you strip away all the qualities of the table and all that's left is a, a thing which has the various table like qualities. Well, what is a thing? is the question, what is, it, what is it that bears the qualities? Um, I think that's kind of like the question of being, or how is it, to me it seems like, how is it that this thing is here? The fact that something is here, you know, explain that. That's the question of being. Uh, so he talks about whether it's problematic or unproblematic, and he sort of says, we're not even able to ask the question, what are beings, because it's unproblematic to us. We don't concern ourselves with it. We go about our day-to-day -day lives and we don't think about it. So it's unproblematic. And until the question is, is problematic, then you can't ask the question. All you can do is recite the words. What are beings? Once the question becomes problematic to you, then you begin to actually ask the question. So then he talks a little bit later about familiarity and more about this problematic nature of the question. He says, let us, he says, quote, let us therefore now attempt to pose the question of being. What are beings? In this question, beings are the interrogated. How do matters stand with them? We already said something about that in the first lecture. We find ourselves at any time in the midst of beings, posed before beings, ourselves as beings, and specifically such that these beings display a certain affiliation without any one of them transparent to us and without our knowing how transparency can be attained. Beings, as a whole, are, in advance, within certain limits, familiar to us, and so are known. Within certain limits, we know what beings are in each case, whether animal or human person, stone or plant, number or tool, still more particularly whether cane or umbrella, book or pen, dog or bird, we know what beings are in what they are in each case. Why then do we still ask the question, what are beings? We know these beings as 
blackboard, book, staircase, door. What each respectively is, its whatness, its essence. And yet we immediately find ourselves in a predicament if we try to say univocally and definitively what the essence of a book, the essence of a staircase consists in, so that the result is we have indeed a certain acquaintance with the whatness of beings, but not a genuine knowledge of it. In contrast to the latter, we call the former the pre-acquaintance with beings in their respective whatness and suchness. This pre-acquaintance with the essence is part of that familiarity with beings which we grow up into and which we claim for ourselves unreflectively without further ado. Beings, as the interrogated of the question of being, are in their essential constitution familiar to us in a certain way and are unproblematic. What then is the unfamiliar and problematic? Certainly unfamiliar to us are many regions of beings and the individuals belonging therein, yet even within familiar regions, much is unfamiliar to us, history, nature. Now, if we, in accord with the sense of the question of being, direct our questioning to the unfamiliar in the familiar, in beings, we are not seeking out some previously uninvestigated regions of beings, the provinces of the sciences, and we are not at all asking what this or that being is, or whether this or that is a being. Instead, we are asking, what are beings as such, just in so far as they are beings? No matter of what kind, of what region, what makes beings beings at all? We answer, being. But with this response, we are not answering the question of being. Instead, we are giving the question for the first time, what is problematic in it? Beings are the familiar, their being is the unfamiliar. Beings are the unproblematic, being is the problematic. In the question, what are beings, we are directing our questioning to being. We are bringing ourselves before what is problematic in the unproblematic. End quote. Okay, so now he, he talks a little bit about the familiarity of, the, of dogs and birds and pens and everything. And he says, we understand these things in their whatness, but what are they, what, what are they as beings insofar as they are beings? Like, kind of like I was saying, like, what, what is a thing? And what makes a thing a thing? And what are beings insofar as they are beings? And he says, the answer then becomes being. Uh, this seems like a great time to jump in with an interjection He's talking about beings, and he's talking about being. And he means two different things. And he capitalizes being to mean like being as such, existence, the fact of reality. When he uses his beings in the plural, he's generally talking about things. And this translator follows along the lines of many translators. In using these two words, being and beings, which is essentially the same word, to mean two different things. In German, the words are slightly different, but also slightly the same. And I think in order to maintain the similarity, they just decided to use the exact same word for both things. I can't say I agree with that choice. The first translators of being and time, whose names were uh, Macquarie and Robinson, when they translated being and time, they used the word the lowercase beings, they said entities. So there were there was being with a capital B, as in the title, being and time, and then there were the various entities that constitute the world. Much simpler that way to comprehend, especially when you can't see the capital letter because you're listening to a podcast. I consider just going in and just deliberately just changing everywhere it says beings into entities for your comprehension, but I thought that would just be a step too far. So I didn't do it. But anyway, back to the point. Um, so he says, we, we comprehend beings. He says, beings are the familiar. He says, their being is the unfamiliar. Beings are the unproblematic, but their being is the problematic. He says, in the question, what are beings, we're directing our questioning to being. We're bringing ourselves before what is problematic in the unproblematic.
So that's cool. The question of being calls forth the being of beings and calls forth the problematic aspect of the of the of reality that brings us to ask the question, which is kind of circular. But I think in reading Heidegger, you kind of have to overlook such things. But he goes on talking here about uh, concealment. So this sort of ties a little bit back to Anaximander, actually, because Anaximander was talking about um, uh, contours and contourlessness and the relation of that to, uh, to appearance and to concealment. He says, quote, Why and for what end should being and the understanding of being be at issue? What happens when they are at issue? Nothing less than this. Beings as a whole, previously concealed from self-manifestation, find for the first time and henceforth in one way or another the sight and amplitude in which they can step forth out of their concealedness in order to be at all as the beings they are. In this way, for the first time, concealment is also provided them. Prior to that, they lacked it. Thereby, beings come by their being. They do so only if and insofar as the understanding of being occurs. And the condition of possibility for it, namely, that this occurrence becomes history, is the transition to the existence of humans. But again, that beings as such come to themselves is not intrinsically necessary even if there already are humans. Beings can remain sunk in the full night of self-shrouded nothingness, such that they are never granted the possibility of being concealed, for there is concealment only if the sight of disconcealment holds good. If, however, beings as such are to come to the light of day, if this day is to dawn for beings, then, as was shown by our attempt at a complete disesteeming of the understanding of being, being must come to be understood in advance. Yet being can never simply be found amid beings as one being among others, nor can it first be drawn out of beings by way of abstraction. Being can therefore nowhere and never simply be encountered. Accordingly, it must be sought originally and entirely for itself, i.e., it must be disclosed through questioning. Humans must undertake this questioning, and the most proximate form in which this questioning starts at all is the question, what are beings? This question already includes the other one, how do matters stand with being? Being is thereby placed into question in advance. What is sought is as such configured, and specifically as what is at issue, when the issue is supposed to be beings as such. Through this original questioning, and only through it, being becomes what is at issue primarily and for all beings. As being comes to be understood in this way, beings as such are empowered to be themselves. Henceforth, they can come to light as the beings they are. Yet now they can first also thrust themselves forward as what they are not and can thereby be disguised and covered over. Heed well. It is enough that questioning merely be directed to being in order for being to be found. The disclosure through questioning brings about as such the essential finding, and being remains a finding only inasmuch and as long as questioning is directed to it. To disclose being through questioning means, first of all, to ask, what are beings as such? By this questioning, humans hold to themselves for the first time, and in this holding to themselves, they explicitly hold themselves over and against that which is encountered in such questioning stance, and thereby they comport themselves to what, namely, beings, is encountered through this questioning. Humans now become that which as existent, stands out of itself, toward beings as such. The questioning directed to being is the basic act of existence. This questioning inaugurates the history of humans as existing humans. End quote. 
Okay, so that's pretty heavy stuff right there. Uh, he talks about day and night a little bit, um, but what I appreciate really is the following line. Uh, he says, he says, quote, it is enough that questioning merely be directed to being in order for being to be found. This disclosure through questioning brings about as such the essential finding, and being remains a finding only in as much and as long as questioning is directed to it. So he's really saying merely the act of questioning being discloses being and provide, begins to provide the answer to the question. And he's also talking about existence. And he's talking about, he says toward the end of that section I read, the questioning directed to being is the basic act of existence. This questioning inaugurates the history of humans as existing humans. So he's really saying that he's talking about existence by which he means beings which are able to comport themselves toward themselves or toward other beings to be able to consider and choose what and which way to comport themselves must well let's see he says yeah humans now in asking well, let me just read this other section here he says to disclose being through questioning means first of all to ask what are beings as such by this questioning humans hold to themselves for the first time and in this holding to themselves they explicitly hold themselves over and against that which is encountered in such a questioning stance thereby they comport themselves to what namely beings is encountered through this questioning yeah so the he, i mean basically he's saying that more or less the 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 question what are beings as such brings about humans as humans humans as existing entities within history and probably like as conscious um the conscious entities that we are in in the various ways that we're different from animals the ability of us to comport ourselves and to think of ourselves as ourselves which generates the existence of the self the ability to be self inward to stand outside yourself. That's how he generates the word existence, is to stand outside yourself, to be able to stand outside yourself and consider yourself. But also the capacity to stand outside yourself is in the capacity to comport yourself and to choose to what your attention is given um, and to have the capacity to question. So let me move on here. Um, oh, I guess the one last thing I want to mention is the concept of insistence. He talks about that in the next area, but... Um, this is the last part I'm going to I'm going to read from. Insistence is basically the human disposition to constantly concern ourselves with beings and to uh, not concern ourselves and not be familiar with being as such. That's our insistence, our insistence towards beings. He says, quote, it must never be forgotten. Questionworthiness and sovereignty are proper to being and to the understanding of being not intrinsically and in general, but only insofar as humans claim and adhere to the liberation toward existence. Admittedly, that occurs also when and where the stance and comportment of humans have the character of insistence. For even then, comportment is the sovereign standing in relation to beings, except now the sovereign and guiding understanding of being is forgotten, and the disclosure of being by way of questioning is abandoned. Accordingly, if the understanding of being is unfamiliar to us and the question of being forgotten, it in no way follows that we do not still claim it, i.e. do not exist. Insistent existence does not abolish the understanding of being. On the contrary, it merely entrenches a conventional mode of this understanding without giving it another thought. The understanding of being does not disappear, it merely hides behind a mask, the mask of what is most unproblematic. As long as we exist insistently, we do not see through to what is behind the mask. On the other hand, as soon as we acquire a regard for the essence of existence, we see that this unproblematic, harmless, insignificant being and understanding of being can be nothing less than what, although disesteemed, is the most questionworthy for existence.' 
This disesteeming of what is most questionworthy, however, does indeed mean leaving the question of being unasked. Leaving it unasked does not eliminate it, but instead suppresses it, as held fast yet unasked. Suppressed in this way, the question of being is still there. Then where? In our insistent existence. Our paying no heed to the suppressed question of being is not a proof against its being there, but merely demonstrates that in suppressing it we mean that we could withdraw from it at any time. We can withdraw from it only in the way the wanderer, distancing himself more and more from the spring, semblantly dissolves every relation to it, and yet perishes precisely through and on this relation of distancing himself. The question of being, as unasked, is in the closest proximity of our Dasein as existent. For what can be more essential to our existence, thus closer and more intimate to it, than the ground of its inner possibility? But that is precisely the question of being, and the disclosive asking of it. Yet the question of being, as we heard earlier, begins philosophy. If the question of being, although unasked, is so essentially close to our existence, then the beginning is in our closest proximity. We stand, in so far as we exist, even if insistently, in this beginning, but in the beginning as one that is no longer begun and has perhaps come to a premature end. The question of being is indeed unasked, but it is not, therefore, nothing. This disesteemed question demands, in a quite different sense and measure, the esteeming that per pertains to it, precisely as the still never posed question. In view of the unasked question of being, being and the understanding of being merely become more questionworthy, if indeed insistence intrinsically claims existence. The results, taking all in all, are the following. To be actually existent means for us to become the ones we are. The basic happening of this becoming, however, is to grasp the ground of the possibility of our existence by fathoming this ground. That means to ask again the unasked question of being, and that implies to begin again the unbegun beginning. The moment we grasp our humanity as existent, the act of beginning the beginning becomes the first and last necessity. Then, however, the beginning no longer lies in back of us as something disposed of, left behind, past. Nor is it simply in the closest proximity as something hidden behind the mask of the most unproblematic. On the contrary, it stands before us as the essential task of our most proper essence. The questionworthiness of being and of the understanding of being, and thus the questionworthiness of the question of being, may have become clear and pressing to us, yet it can never be deduced from this that we must consequently go back to the first beginning of Western philosophy. On the contrary, is not the beginning all the more immediately asked, the more exclusively we, today, ask it completely from our own present resources? We, from our own resources. But who, then, are we? if we understand our being from the ground of its possibility. We exist in our being. We are constructed on the understanding of being, even more on the already asked question of being, and on what it discloses of being in questioning. Insofar as we exist, that beginning still ever happens. It has been, but it is not past as having been. It prevails and keeps us of today in its essence. Ever since, our humanity as existent has been grounded on the occurrence of the beginning. Ever since, any asking of the question of being, provided it is an actual self-aware questioning, has become a re-asking, one intrinsically historical and thus properly historiological. Historiological cognition is not merely aimed at retaining what has been and delivering back up to us what was retained. Instead, its basic task, above all, is to take what has been and cast it up into the heights of its respective greatness. Historiology that is not given to preserving the greatness of what has been, historiology that does not succeed in assuring that this greatness remains great, 
is an odious pastime in no way justified by being carried out as an exact science. On the contrary, the unrelenting rigor of this scientific work first receives its sense and justification from such preserving and assuring. The asking of the question of being is intrinsically historical and historiological, as is all philosophizing. But not primarily and only because the first beginning, on account of its essentially unattainable greatness, can be and must be the paradigm and guide for our questioning, and therefore the place we must begin, but because our asking of the question of being, precisely if it arises entirely out of our own resources and out of our clarified essence, is of itself sent back into a confrontation with the beginning. It would amount to pondering a pseudo-problem if we were to ask whether and how systematic philosophy and the history of philosophy are supposed to go together for the separation of them is already mistaken about the essence of philosophy. One of the most fatal delusions to which modern and contemporary efforts in philosophy have fallen victim is the view that the history of philosophy can be appended arbitrarily, occasionally, and subsequently according to taste and preference simply in order to illustrate the real thoughts. To co-ask the question of beginning, a re-beginning of the initial beginning, is not an arbitrary occupation, not something that runs its course apart from beings, certainly not an indifferent consideration that would be crammed onto beings and could be just as easily left off. On the contrary, in deciding whether and how the question of being is asked, and whether and how it remains unasked, it is thereby decided, in general, how matters stand concerning the being of beings and what possibility and amplitude are provided and prepared for being in order that beings be the beings they are. It is thus decided how matters stand concerning the manifestness of beings, concerning truth as such. What is primarily decisive is not which truths we discover and which ones we adhere to, but instead what truth in essence is for us at all, the question of being. End quote. So that was a that was a long section there and um, kind of challenging and hard for me to summarize to be honest, um, but it does kind of come back to the necessity of re-asking uh, the beginning today and our inability to escape from it, and that even if we re-ask it today, we can't necessarily sever ourselves uh, from approaching it, and. Uh, Yes, I mean, the one line here that I kind of was drawn to is the following one when he says, quote, The question of being is indeed unasked, but is not therefore nothing. The disesteemed question demands, in a quite different sense and measure, the esteeming that pertains to it, precisely as the still never posed question. Basically saying that the question of being is unasked, but must retain, must re reacquire the esteem that pertains to it. And, uh, I don't know, I think that's cool. A real, a, an entire, essentially saying that knowledge of the question of being demands a reorientation of all of philosophy towards it. It's kind of what I get out of that. Anyway, that was the last section that I wanted to read. Um, there was a lot that I covered, I think. I feel like it was a lot. And it's hard for me to summarize because I'm not a professional philosopher, but I liked that middle section there, I felt like I was able to absorb enough of it to be able to get a grasp on Heidegger's in insistence upon the question of being and the tying of the earliest of philosophy, which I just find myself really drawn to anyway, is like the beginnings of Western philosophy. I mean, it just seems important, Western philo Western civilization being like so driven by Western philosophy, the, be the very birth of Western philosophy seems an important thing to examine. Um, so, yeah. That's a, it's a pretty interesting, I'm going to continue on. I'm, I'm really kind of doing a deep dive into these pre-Socratic philosophers. So my next book, this one touched on Anaximander, touched on Parmenides, and I think that the only thing I mentioned, Alethea, he identifies the goddess as Alethea. That was all I wanted to mention about Parmenides. The next book is going to go into Heraclitus, which this one largely skips over. I'll continue on with the pre-Socratics. I've got a few more books that I want to do to hit on some of these ancient Greek philosophers to extract as much wisdom as possible. So, tune in next time. Bye.